morning, Alex. How was your weekend? Great. I had a relaxing, quiet weekend at home. It was nice. What about you? It was good. I went for a hike and rested the rest of the weekend. What about you, Gary? I had a great weekend. Thanks for asking. Well, that's me. See you both around. Bye, Alex. Bye. They are so sweet. Wish they still worked in our department. They? Who are they? Alex. Sure. She's just one person, though. Alex is non-binary. What is non-binary? Non-binary means they don't identify with male or female, which means Alex's pronouns aren't he or she. Instead, they ask to be referred to as they, their, or them. Hmm, interesting. So what are pronouns, then? I guess I'm not fully understanding. Well, Gary, pronouns and preferred gender pronouns have slightly different definitions. Pronouns, in the traditional sense, are what you're thinking of. They are a word that refers to either the people talking, like you and I, or someone that is being talked about, like her or his. Right. So Alex prefers to be referred to as them? Right. Preferred gender pronouns are simply the pronouns or set of pronouns that an individual would like others to use when talking to or about them. All right. Well, that makes more sense. I feel bad. I've been referring to Alex as a she for a while now. That's all right, Gary. Not everyone realizes how important preferred gender pronouns are. People don't always think to ask. Right. I never thought to ask something like that before. I assumed it might be rude. It's not rude. It's better to get it right than to not know. Using a person's chosen pronoun is a form of mutual respect and understanding. Well, I'm glad that I know now. I'll be sure to ask from now on. Speaking of which, what are your preferred pronouns? Thanks for asking, Gary. I prefer she and her. I even recently added my preferred pronouns to my email signature and LinkedIn page. All right, and I prefer he and his. I'll go update my signature now. It is important to remember that we can't always see someone's gender identity with our eyes. Gender identity is someone's internal sense of their gender, and to be a true ally, it is important to respect that and always refer to others by the correct pronouns. This reduces the risk of embarrassment or disrespect for everyone involved. Pronouns are incredibly important. They're the easiest way to acknowledge someone's identity. And in order to respect all humans, it's crucial to use the correct ones. So here's our guide to using the right gender pronouns. Let's kick off with some important definitions. Gender identity. Your gender identity is a way to describe how you feel about your gender. This is one's internal sense of self as a man, woman, both, neither, or something else. Gender neutrality. Gender neutrality is all about not making assumptions on someone's gender identity based on the way they look or act. Okay, so now we've got the definitions down, let's take a look at some of the most common gender neutral pronouns. There's such a wonderful world beyond the binary. One of the most common gender neutral pronouns used by genderqueer and gender non-conforming people is they, them, their. But it's certainly not the only option. So let me explain. Some people use the gender neutral pronouns Z, he, his, and other people use A, M, theirs. There's absolutely loads of gender neutral pronouns out there. If you want to know more information about them, head to our description and click on the link. Now here's some tips for using and understanding genderqueer or non-binary pronouns. Enjoy! Never assume a pronoun. If you're meeting someone for the first time and don't know which pronoun to use, just ask the person you're chatting to. It'll go a little something like this. Hello, new human that I'm meeting in a pub. I'm Libby. Nice to meet you, Libby. I'm Alex. If you don't mind me asking, Alex, what pronouns do you use? Good question, Libby. I use they, them. What about you? Well, thanks for asking. I use she, her. Anyway, should we get a pint? It's that simple. And if you're meeting a bunch of people, you can apply the same gender neutral language. Instead of saying ladies or guys, try to incorporate language that isn't gendered, such as folks, pals, or friends. Basically, just don't go around assuming pronouns. Don't be that person. Of course, there might be times when you slip up and get a pronoun wrong. We get it, mistakes happen. Don't make a big deal out of it, say sorry, correct yourself, and move on. The best apology is not doing it again. 
An even better apology is to become an ally. If you overhear someone using the wrong pronouns for a mutual friend, correct them. Be the ally that the non-binary, genderqueer and trans people in your community deserve. You should also bring your new ally status to work. Encourage your colleagues to start using their preferred gender pronouns at the start of meetings or include a place for pronouns on your name tags or badges. You can even buy pre-made pronoun stickers and they are pretty damn fabulous. This will all help towards normalising the idea that people shouldn't just assume that they can tell someone's pronoun based on the traditional gendering of a name. So there you have it. Thank you for watching our very brief guide to using the right gender pronouns. What pronouns do you go by? Let us know in the comments. Bye-bye! Good morning, everyone. Some of you I know, some of you I don't know. Um, I appreciate the, um, the ask to be a part of this. I mean, I've been a part of NABJ for a really long time, and the organization has come really far, and we are having an LGBTQ sensitivity training. That's awesome. <laughs> and I'm so happy to be the one that's helping um, to facilitate the discussion and to be a part of it. Disclosure. I am the L in LGBTQ+, and I don't even know all of the letters and the acronyms. So if you don't, don't feel bad. Like, it, we're, it's constantly evolving. Um, as more and more people feel comfortable and um, come up with terms to identify who they are, um, and let us know. Letters are being added. Um, new terms are being created. Um, but um, actually, but everybody, I think at this point in time, um, you know, knows what, um, you know, lesbian means, right? The, these the lesbian, gay, um, bisexual, those are pretty, I, I, they've been around for a while, people understand. The ones that people are having a lot of trouble with, for example, are pansexual, right? What does that mean? Um, it's a person who experiences sexual, romantic, physical, or spiritual attraction for members of all gender identities or expressions. And later on in this conversation, we're going to talk about gender identities and expressions. Um, when we talk about um, our transgender brothers and sisters, um, you know, when we use the word transgender, it can be an umbrella term um, that covers a range of identities. Um, but trans is also used to indicate that you are, you know, a person who lives as a member of a gender other than that that was expected um, based off of your anatomical sex, okay? Um, transsexual, which is not a word that is really used that much, but um, a person who identifies psychologically as a gender sex other than the one to which they were assigned at birth. A person, I'm going to say it again, a person who identifies psychologically as a gender sex other than the one to which they were assigned at birth. And again, stop me if you have questions, because some, you know, some of this can be confusing. Um, transsexuals often wish to transform um, their bodies hormonally and surgically to match their inner sense of gender sex. Um, queer is an interesting term. Queer, um, depending on what generation you are, uh, even in the um, uh, uh, LGBTQ+, same gender loving community, I say same gender loving because as Black folks, we use that terminology a lot too. Queer can be a good word or a bad word. Typically today in 2020, a lot of uh, people like to use that word as an umbrella word to describe the entire community. You will hear me throughout this conversation probably use the word queer here and there just because you can get a little tongue twisted trying to go through the entire um, alphabet. And so sometimes I try to shorten it up and use the word queer. It is an umbrella term used to describe individuals who don't identify as heterosexual. Um, questioning um, is an individual who um, is someone who is unsure about or is exploring their own sexual orientation or gender. Intersex 
is um, an important word. Intersex is someone who, whose combination of chromosomes um, and um, genitals and sex organs differ from the, the two expected patterns of male and female. In the medical um, world, in the medical care of infants, um, they use the term called DSD, Differing Disorder of Sex Development. Um, for, for, formerly, it was known as being a hermaphrodite, but we don't use that word anymore. Those words are, cons that word is definitely considered outdated and derogatory. If you use that word, you should definitely take it out of your vocabulary. Um, the preferred word is intersex. Um, there's intergender, there's asexual, and I'm going to go through some of these a little more in um, depth in other slides. Um, asexual is uh, having a lack of or a low level of sexual attraction to others and or a lack of interest or desire for sex or sexual partners. Um, that is asexual. Ally, um, we're going to talk a lot about being an ally. Allies are typically straight or um, cis-identified people. We're going to talk about what cis-identified means. Um, who support and respect members of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and we're going to ignore the dead naming because that wasn't supposed to be on there. So why does the list keep growing? I kind of talked about that a little earlier. It's It continues to evolve because it's a process in and of itself. Um, you know, language changes all the time. Um, and like I said, you know, um, as people are coming into their identity and feeling confident and strong and defining who they are, um, we are being given new terms to learn. And at the beginning of this conversation, I said to you all that it was okay to make mistakes and it's okay to ask questions. I can't tell you how many times it took me to figure out what cisgendered me meant. It just did. It just wasn't something that clicked for me automatically. And we're going to talk about that in the next slide. So there are people who are considered to be up, you know, under the umbrella and and the queer umbrella who also struggle with it. So if you struggle with it, you know, you're not alone. But ask ask questions. This is one of my favorite things. Facts. It's important for people to self-identify us for people to self-identify and for us to believe people when they do identify. Just like being Black is important to you, being a Black man is important to you, being a Black woman is important to you. For people like myself, you know, being, you know, a Black same gender loving woman is important to me. Like, it's not all of who I am, but it certainly is a part of who I am. And so when people, whether it's in the workplace or you know, your friends or families, when they take the time to confide in you and tell you who they are, you know, you should believe them and adhere to that and respect how they wish to be identified. That's a really big issue in 2020 in a lot of our communities. Um, there's a lot of pushback around that. But the bottom line is the only person who gets to define you is you, you know. So if I tell somebody that my name is Joe Black, my name is Joe Black, okay? And the same thing goes with, with um, folks who, um, uh, you know, decide what they want to be identified as. You, you, you have to respect that. You don't have to like it, but you should certainly respect it. Oh, this is a, this is one of my favorite parts. We're going to hear from some of our uh, our members in the group about their sort of shared experiences around um, their identities and how they feel, like how they've been navigating through you know their workspaces with their colleagues and um, some of the things that are on their minds. So whoever wants to go first, Travel or Femi. Um, I'll start. Um, hey, everybody. Um, so for those who don't know, tr uh, myself and Femi are co-chairs of the LGBTQ Task Force um, for NABJ. Um, I am also LA President um, and Region 4 Director. I think it, it's also probably important to share I am a uh, queer, non-binary person of trans experience. I use they, them pronouns. 
Um, I think what's important for me as we have this conversation is that we're all journalists and communications professionals. Um, and I think anybody who is looking to do their job right, um, I think it's important for us to be open to, you know, understanding and growing and learning new terminology um, and the ways in which, you know, microaggressions that many of us experience because we're Black people in some of these spaces, we as queer and trans folks also um, experience these things. Um, I think for me, in my experience, being a non-binary person living in a very gendered, binary gendered world, um, you know, a lot of the ways in which I don't feel safe or don't feel welcome or don't feel supported um, pop up in ways that, that folks might not pay attention to. So whether it's certain language that you're using that may be gendered um, or whether it is the ways in which folks, you know, struggle with pronouns. Um, I just think it's important that we, um, particularly as an ABJ um, and we as journalists um, are doing everything we can to make all Black journalists feel welcome in this space. Um, and so I'll throw it to Femi. Hey folks, I'm Femi Redwood. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, in addition to being the co-chair, like Travel mentioned, I'm also a board member of NA NLGJA, the LGBTQ Journalists Association. So I so say that to say this is obviously something that I care really about, um, not just journalism being diverse, but also intersectional. Um, so there's, there's a story that I share often in circles like this, which is uh, the one time I was ever written up at any of my jobs, um, the disciplinary report said that Femi makes her coworkers uncomfortable when she talks about racism, sexism, and homophobia. It was all of those three things. And I say that to say oftentimes when we talk about oppression and discrimination, these things exist with each other. So it's like, I can't bring my full self in some newsrooms because my full self involves not just being a black woman, but also a queer woman. And so that's why I think this, import this conversation is incredibly important. Um, while my struggle because I am a cis straight presenting woman is different from someone else's. Um, someone else like Travel, we have completely different experiences. But at the same time, anytime there's there's a joke that like straight presenting queer women always talk about, which is that whenever we introduce ourselves, we are always coming out over and over and over again. And I can tell you there are times where I am at NEBJ or in newsrooms or in these different circles where there's always that like that anxiety when you tell someone that you have a wife or me, I have a wife, I'm queer, I'm lesbian, whatever. Um, so that's why this conversation is incredibly important because all of these things exist with each other. And I think we all, we all want journalism to be diverse. We all want black journalists to be able to succeed, but that has to also include queer journalists. Yeah, I, I agree very, that very well spoken. Um, you know, it's also very interesting because being a queer woman who, um, I again, I struggle with the cisgender, right? Um, people assume that I'm um, heterosexual all the time. Like that's an assumption that I get all the time is that, you know, I got kids at home and I got some man somewhere or I need a man. So, <laughs> you know, and I, I get it all the time. Um, but thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing um, your words before I uh, move on. Um, I do want to, uh, because we are Black folk, okay, we're going to have a little bit of Black conversation right now. When we talk about terminology, a lot of these words, you know, come from the white gay community. And um, when you think about the gay civil rights movement in this country, it has mostly been led by white gay folks. Um, only recently have we started kind of inching in there and demanding that our agenda and our voices, um, you know, be heard. Um, but it's still it's still an ongoing um, discussion. It's something I've been a part of, um, and Roland can tell you for over twenty years. Um, but in our community, we got our own words. So. You know, while you hear LGBT and Q in the Black community, you'll hear words like the down low. You'll hear words like femme. 
right? You'll hear words like stud. And that though that's that's you know in our community though and it's and I all of that is on the um document that I I dropped in the chat for you guys. But I think it's also very important as black journalists, as black people that we also acclimate and know the words that we that black people, black queer folks use um in amongst themselves. So a, a few of the phrases that I, I, I gave you definitions for were down low femme, um, one of the children, because you might hear that. And, you know, uh, I see Travel smiling over there. So Travel know all about that. Um, you might hear queen. That's another word. Um, same gender loving. Um, you know, a friend of mine, Dr. Cleo Monago, he uh, coined that term, I want to say in the mid 90s, um, for Black people who did not want to um, sort of identify with the white European definition of what it meant to be um, gay. And so you'll hear a lot of Black people use SGL or same gender loving, and that's what that means. Um, then there's STEM. And who, you know, is a person whose gender expression falls somewhere between a stud and a femme. Um, and studs are sort of really like how Black women, the Black, you know, white women might say butch, Black women will say stud. So that's like the masculine, you know, uh, presenting woman. And so anyway, I put all that terminology in there. I didn't want to skip over that. I wanted um, to make sure. I see there's a lot of questions in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to try to go through the presentation and then we can get to the questions. So hopefully we'll, we're moving along. So I think we'll be able to, but I didn't want to skip over the, the, the terms that black people use because as black journalists, as black people, it's important that we know how we talk to our people and we know also what words are, are um, okay for us to use amongst each other. Right. And we're going to talk about the words that aren't okay. Pronouns, isn't that everybody's favorite topic, right? They, they just popped up out of nowhere, right? And now everybody uses pronouns. And I'm going to say, I put, my pro, I put my pronouns by my name and they disappeared. I'm going to put them there again. I try to put that on there when I do my Zooms um, to be respectful. Um, but pronouns, you know, that this is 2020. And I'm sorry, but we are not going to get, a, I, you know, we're not going to get out of not um, respecting people's personal pronouns. This, this is just where we are in the world. And um, it's not a bad thing. We should um, respect people's pronouns. At this point in life, it should be a normal, everyday thing to ask what some, what someone's pronoun is and if you don't know what someone's pronoun is listen um for them to either sort of identify their own correct pronouns or for someone else in the conversation um to do so and if that doesn't happen um try telling them what yours are and then ask them what theirs are i will tell you a story travel doesn't know about this but travel is going to know about it now Travelle and I had a conversation a couple of months ago on the phone, and I remember saying something to Travelle like, okay, girl, something, something, whatever. And then when we got off the phone, I felt so guilty. I was like, that wasn't right, Jasmine. You didn't even ask. You didn't, you're not even sure if that. And then later I found out that Travelle went by they, them. So I felt even more guilty. So here's your public apology. You probably don't even remember that conversation, but it stayed with me because I try to be really respectful of people's personal pronouns. Um, it is okay to ask someone. It is okay to ask someone what their personal pronouns are, how they want to go, what they want to go by. In my signature, in my personal email, it says she, her, hers, and Miss Canick if you're nasty, because I am a Janet Jackson fan. But um, it's 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 okay, you know. You don't have to play the guessing game because sometimes if you guess nine times out of ten, you're probably going to get it wrong. So just ask the person, and then going forward, you will know. And let me tell you something else. 
Just because they tell you what it is doesn't mean you are going to magically get it right every single time. And so on our part, you know, it's up to us, it, it, it's incumbent on us to have understanding when people are trying, right? Not to throw them under the bus just because they made one mistake. I mean, it takes time to remember that someone wants to go by they, them, especially if they went by, you know, she, her, hers, you know, not too long ago. So on, on both sides, it takes a lot of understanding. And I, I, I say that a lot in the LGBTQ plus community too, because sometimes people get so hot and so mad so quickly with the slightest error, they think it's intentional and sometimes it's not. You know, it, it, people are being asked to learn things late in their careers, late in their life. These are things that did not exist five, 10 years ago, but are now commonplace, right? It's just very commonplace, but it takes some time to get used to it. Um, but I think it's important that we use the correct pronouns. It's a way of showing respect, and it's also a way to create an inclusive environment. Um, you know, just as it can be offensive or even harassing to make up a nickname for someone and call them that nickname against their will, it can be offensive or harassing to guess at someone's pronouns or refer to them as using those pronouns, um, especially if that's not how they want to be known. So, you know, again, you know, if this is, I, I hear a, pronouns for a lot of people as an issue. Um, and if this is one of your things where it's just like, oh, I just can't get it. I don't understand it. You don't have to understand it. I mean, really, the only thing you need to know is you want to be respected as a person and they want to be respected as a person. And if this is how they get their respect, then you have a responsibility um, to adhere to it. That's really the bottom line. <sighs> Okay, let's see what we got going on. Oh, yes, let's talk about gender. So, in case you haven't heard, we're in the middle of a gender revolution, and we are. Um, people aren't just male and female anymore. People are trans, they're gender fluid, non-binary, a gender. That was a new one for me. Um, you know, people are not confining themselves to the classification of the bodies they were born with or um, society's rules um, for what those bodies can and cannot do. Um, that is where we are in 2020. And as we go further and further and further into these discussions, um, you know, you will see uh, more and more changes around that. And so I want to go through a couple of the um, words are expressions that you hear a lot just so you understand them because they are very important and there's something that confuse a lot of people. So gender expression, right? Gender expression is the external, so outside, the external display of one's gender through a combination of dress, demeanor, social behavior, and other factors generally measured on scales of masculinity and femininity, also referred to as gender presentation. So my gender expression it, I'm extra girly. I love being extra girly. I'm super, super feminine. So that's like my gender expression. That's how I present myself, right? Um, and so you could take some time to think about how do you present yourself? Gender identity is internal. So whereas expression is external, identity is internal. And it's the perception that you have um, and how you've labeled yourself um, based on how you align or don't align with um, what you understand you the options for, for gender to be, right? So basically, the short and skinny of that is your gender identity is how you, what you feel you are. So, for example, I can dress like this and dress, feel, you know, all extra girly, whatever, but inside, I can feel like I'm a male. So that would be my gender identity. So internal, external. Gender nonconforming is another term, and it's used to describe people whose gender expression is different from conventional expectations of masculinity and femininity. And I'll also add that not all gender uh, nonconforming people identify as transgender. I think that's really important. Um, nor are all transgender people gender nonconforming. Uh, many people have gender expressions that are not entirely conventional today. Um, 
That fact alone doesn't make them transgender. Many transgender men and women have gender expressions that are conventionally masculine or feminine. Um, just being transgender does not mean, I'm sorry, just being transgender does not mean, does not make someone's, I'm losing my place, does not make someone's gender non-conforming. So I know that we have um, at least one self-identified non-binary person, Travel. you identified as non-binary, correct? Yes. Yes. And so I wanted to ask you, did you want to add anything else to, and as a matter of fact, why, why I asked you that I'm going to go to the next slide. Did you want to add anything else to this conversation? Um, no, I would just, I, I think, you know, one of the things we're talking about in the chat is, you know, terms and words that like I might be okay with as a non-binary person of trans experience, the next non-binary person of trans experience might not be right. okay with. Right. So it's very important, I think, for all of us to, you know, treat every interaction with every single person, whether they're LGBTQ or not, in a way that allows you to get as much information as necessary to refer to them in the ways that they wish to be referred to. And if all else fails, just ask them. Right. That's always. Yeah. So um, I I love this graphic. It's the gender bred person. Um, it is meant to easily help you understand uh, the different gender um, expressions. So identity in your head, attraction in your heart, expression on the outside, and then your biological sex. Okay, so gender queer is another term that um, if you don't hear it often now, you will be hearing it a lot. Um, and it's um, a gender identity label um, used by people who don't identify with the you know, binary of man, woman. Um, it can be an umbrella term for many gender non-conforming or non-binary identities. Going back to what I mentioned earlier, one was a gender, there's bi-gender and gender fluid. Um, gender queer people may think of themselves as one or more of the following, and they may define these terms um, differently. Um, make, uh, they can combine aspects of man and woman and other identities, um, not having a gender or identifying with a gender, moving between genders, genders, I've heard of this one too, third gender or other gendered. Um, and it also includes those who do not place a name to their gender. Um, having an overlap of or blurred lines between gender identity, sexual and romantic or orientation. This is a lot. I know it's a lot. It is, you know, it, like I said in the beginning, it can be confusing even for people who are under the umbrella. But part of being an ally, part of, um, you know, yeah, just part of being an ally and I just think even just as journalists, you would want to know this information because it can only make you a better one, right? Because when we are dealing with people, whether it's in our newsrooms or people um, that we're covering, I mean, these are all the different types of um, different um, folks that we, we will come across that identify in these different various ways. Oh, yes. And a few more important words. We will get in. So ally, which we kind of talked about, um, typically straight or cisgendered people who support and have respect for the LGBTQ community. Cisgender, the one that took me a minute to understand, is a person whose gender identity and biological sex assigned at birth. Um, a person whose gender identity and biologic, biological sex assigned at birth. A simple way to think about it is um, if a person is not trans, they are cisgender. So, for example, I was um, I was born a female, and my gender identity is that of a female. So, I am a cisgendered woman. So, it might take you a little while to get the hang of that, but even throughout this conversation, you've heard um, a number of your colleagues, um, when they were speaking, used the word cis because it has now become a 
um, a common part of our, our vocabulary. Um, and so I think it's important for people who haven't picked up on the meaning of cisgender that they should familiarize themselves with it. Or you're also going to find yourself lost in conversations if you don't understand what that means. And then um, this last one is one of my favorite ones, heteronormativity. And that's the assumption that individuals are institutions and individuals are institutions and organizations that everyone is heterosexual and that heterosexual heterosexuality is superior to all other sexualities. And we have a lot of that going on uh, in this country. Um, it's often included, often included in this concept as a level of gender normativity and gender roles and the assumption that individuals should identify as man or woman. And yes, we deal with that a lot. Um, and they should be masculine men and feminine women. And if they're, and if you're not one of those two, then the, there's something wrong with you. Um, and that's something that we um, have to break out of. Um, and of course, and finally, that men and women are a complementary pair, meaning that there's no other couple but a male, a masculine male, and a feminine woman. And this is 2020. This is not 1960. Uh, we have evolved. We understand that um, that is not um, everybody's truth. That is not everybody's story, and we respect that. Um, but there's still a lot of work to do in that area. Um, particularly um, within our community, within the Black community. Um, and, you know, I'm here for it. We need to do that work. Um, all right, so we ha I have another exercise. Oh, one of my favorite, microaggressions. That's, that's a perfect segue, microaggressions. So the LGBTQ plus community, um, like Black folks and white environments, um, LGBTQ plus folks um, are on the receiving end of a lot of microaggressions, um, which, you know, for me is just shade. They just are given a lot of shade. And people think that it's okay. Um, and in organizations and institutions, when you have an environment where microaggression, microaggressions, particularly against queer people, go unchecked, it creates an environment where people are uncomfortable. Like they don't feel like they can bring all of who they are to to whatever the work is that they're a part of. Um, and so, you know, knowing that we acknowledge that we all have biases and that some of us are just straight up outright homophobic and transphobic, let's just keep it real. Some of us um, fall into that range. Um, and most workplace homophobic and transphobic issues stem from microaggressions. Um, for example, you know, there's an Asian American student who's complimented by a professor for speaking perfect English, even though the student's first language is English. Um, an employee constantly asks a queer colleague for um, his thoughts on some, you know, gay TV show without even first checking to see if they even watch that show, but they just assume because they're gay, they watch that show. So like if you, you know, for me, for example, it would be, okay, she a black woman. So she definitely watches the Real Housewives of Atlanta or some, some, cra I almost said shit, some crap like that. No, I do not. I don't know anything about that show at all. Okay. Don't watch it. Don't want to watch it. But we all make these kinds of assumptions. Those are microaggressions. So, um, I wanted to have a conversation, I wanted to have a quick conversation um, for those who want to participate um, about the different um, microaggressions that you may have experienced in your workplace, um, you know, different, um, like I sit on a couple of different boards and I got to deal with some stuff on the boards that I sit on, um, but just, you know, just as a Black person, as a Black journalist, a Black male, a Black woman, um, a Black queer person, what are some of the microaggressions that are, are thrown your way? So microaggressions are, first. microaggressions are just, is just rudeness or, I'm trying to understand how you define a microaggression. It's, it's more than rudeness. Okay, it's when a person's biases against like a marginalized group, right? So, and I'm, I'm, 
you know, I'm trying to move through this, but like, you know, as black people, we can oppress other black people. Believe that, right? We can oppress black queer folk, right? Black heterosexual folks can, uh, we can have biases. And so they reveal themselves in a way that leaves like their victim feeling uncomfortable or insulted. That's why I said it's like shade. It's like, you know, you, you say something that, let me give another example. Okay, a black man notices that a white woman flinches and grabs her bag closer to her um, every time she sees him in the elevator, um, that is a microaggression. Like seeing that, you know. Uh, so it's racism. It's racism, but not overt racism. Oh, it's more than racism. It can be microaggressions don't just have to do with race. Like I said, mm -hmm. you know, microaggressions are thrown at folks in the queer community all the time, you know? And so even as, as Black women, you know, we get, um, like I, I had a friend in my office yesterday and she was telling me about a job interview that she had and, um, she's Jamaican and she has um, uh, really long um, locks. And she said that the person that interviewed her at the end, end of the interview said to her, well, I just want to let you know, if you, if we bring you on, you know, we don't do a lot of partying here. We're not a party organization. We don't, you know, get high and stuff. And that was like, literally an assumption on her part right it was a microaggression that because my friend was Jamaican and she had locks like that's kind of how she got down you know mm -hmm. that um, shade we well and we call it shade so Jasmine yeah. uh, do you think sometimes it's coming from a place of like total ignorance and not microaggression um there was a, a fellow journalist who was speaking here in Texas and she was talking about being black and being Latina and how she was being treated. And then she said, she talked about her mom and she said that her mom was a low person on a totem pole. And the folks at the table with me looked at each other like, oh my gosh, I know she didn't say that because some of them were Native American. And sometimes just like we're learning things here today that will help yeah. us go out. Because, you know, I feel like as a black woman, I'm trying to help them to understand me. Yeah, okay. no, I, I do believe that there are, there's some ignorance involved, right? People, things that people just don't know. But I also believe that, um, and I think other people can speak to their experiences too, that, you know, people do things on purpose to make people feel uncomfortable. Um, it happens can, all the time. Um, I, I know Ken has his hand up, Femi. One second, because Ken yeah. is at his hand up for a minute. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, so I, I get this a lot, particularly before COVID, when you would call ahead and set up an interview with someone, and then they get there and they go, but I thought you were white. Right. You don't sound Black. I'm like, mm -hmm. what do you think black people sound like? Really? So that, that, yeah, go ahead. Femi. Hey, yeah, I was just gonna say, um, micro, the, for me, the easiest way I've been able to explain microaggression to people who have a hard time understanding this concept is like a tiny little knife punching into you. Like, it doesn't really matter that the person's not trying to like, kill you, but there's a tiny little knife like punching into you. And it's still, despite intent, it still hurts. Um, so some of the microaggressions, just to give uh, people a better understanding that I've dealt with in my career would be, like Ken said, the you speak very well. Um, uh, earlier on in my career, what I would hear a lot, especially after I told people that I was a lesbian was questioning whether or not my father was present in my life, which he is, he's still married to my mom. Um, some of the other things that I've heard in the career, in my career, um, in the last, um, last Olympics with a lot of the figure skating, some of the conversations in my newsrooms was, you know, um, every male figure skater must be gay because have you ever met a male figure skater who is straight? Um, just, yeah, that's, and I, yeah, there, <laughs> 
plenty of microaggressions out there, but they are all just as hurtful. Another one that I can think of just off the top of my head, and this is why I say these things don't exist by themselves. Um, one of those same coworkers that I had an issue with racism, one day he pulled me to the side and said, my brother's marrying, my cousin's marrying a black woman, that should make you happy. So those are the type of things that are, that are, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Travel. I can see your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, here's the, here's the other thing, right? I think as Black people, all of us can agree that over the past four years under the current president, we've had to deal with a lot of microaggressions of all kinds coming from all kinds of people, right? Because microaggressions in this country went up quite I mean, some of the stuff wasn't even micro. I mean, was it wasn't even overt. It was just. Cl I mean, it was. Uh, it, it was just like, uh, you know. But uh, it, yeah. Anyway. But yeah, there are a lot of microaggressions. I think we need to be aware of them. And you know, Cheryl, to your point, yes, people don't always realize it. And so, like for me, you know. Um, again, maybe this just comes with age. Um, I'm not old, but you know, I'm a little, you know, I'm not in my twenties anymore. I'm more sure of myself. I will correct you. I will tell you something like I won't, I won't let you walk away from the conversation, not knowing that you are wrong so that the next person doesn't have to be on the end of your microaggressions. Okay. And I think so. So I think it's important for all of us to keep that in mind too. When we feel those little knives jabbing at us, when we feel when people are um, are are uh, giving us uh, microaggressions, where we're receiving those from folks, that um, we talk to them about it. I mean, one of the worst things is to just stand there and keep taking it over and over and over again. So, can I, um, I would like to frame the. Can can I can I frame the concept of ten from thinking about it from a mentally from a legal standpoint? Um, there is something that someone does to you that's intentional, and I think that's a lot of ways that we we view you know, say a micro microaggression, but there's also a standard of negligence, and with negligence you have a duty to for some to do something, and then you breach whatever that duty is. So just like we're here on this call. And just like we think is important to all other members of society, we have a duty to learn what offends other people. And so when we breach that duty, our negligence causes us to perform a microaggression, whether we are intend to do it or not. And so it's incumbent upon us to continue to learn. That doesn't necessarily mean we're bad people, but it's just that we've failed in that duty in that moment. Right. So that's what the correct Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of goes into... Um, uh, you know, um, inclusion and um, some of the other things that I'm going to try to get into. Um, so social identities, um, you know, whether we're aware of it or not, we are all assigned multiple social identities. Um, within each category, there's a hierarchy, um, a, you know, a social status with dominant and non-dominant groups. So I think I said earlier that uh, it is possible for Black people to oppress other Black people. Um, that is a real facts. Those are facts. Um, as with race, dominant members can bestow benefits to members they deem normal or limit opportunities to members that fall into other categories. Um, and we do do that. Um, so, you know, a person of a non-dominant group, um, uh, one of the others, um, can experience, um, you know, um, in the form of limitations like disadvantages or disapproval, those microaggressions, they suffer abuse from folks, whether it's, um, you know, in their families um, or in their organizations, um, you know, oppression can refer to a combination of, you know, prejudice and institutional power that, you know, creates a system that regularly and severely discriminates against some groups and benefits other groups. That has happened um, a lot within the Black community. One institution uh, that I can think of that has participated in that is a Black church. Um, they're working on it and we're pushing them to work on it, you know, it's a tug, it's a tug and pull. We're going we gonna to keep working on them. But the Black church has um, 
definitely been oppressive to, to Black same gender loving people. And I think that, um, again, like when we're just thinking about how we interact with people, how we, you know, listen to people and try to respect people, we also have to remember like sort of the privilege that we have. We always talk about white privilege, right? Well, you know what, you know, Black people, Black heterosexual people walk around like they got a privilege too over um, Black queer folk, as if somehow we are not on the same level as, as, as uh, Black heterosexual folk. And we should not ever be in the business of oppressing each other. Um, and so I wanted to include that in this discussion just so that, you know, it was on our minds to um, think about. So I have this other um, exercise. I don't know. I'm going to, I might save it for the end because I don't know if we're going to have time to get through it. I'm trying to get through everything. If we have time, I'll do the walking in someone else's shoe exercise towards the end. But there are some things I do not want to get out of this conversation without talking about. And one of them um, is definitely the harmful stereotypes about the queer community. Some of the members on this call have touched on them already. Um, but I also put some of the more popular ones over here to the side that we hear or, you know, uh, in our communities, you can't be gay and religious, you can't be queer and religious, um, you can't be, you know, a black lesbian and a Christian, um, as if the two somehow don't go together, that all lesbians are masculine. Yes, yes, that's, that's, that's one I hear a lot. Um, uh, and uh, it's not true. Clearly, I'm not masculine. Neither is Femi. Um, All gay men are effeminate and flamboyant. That is definitely not true. Um, all gay men are sexual predators or pedophiles. We hear that a lot. Um, and that is definitely not true. And we should not be perpetuating those stereotypes that trans people are mentally ill. Trans people are not mentally ill. Um, that bisexual people are pro um, promiscuous. That is not true either. Um, and that members of the LGBTQ plus community are trying to convert others. Let's be clear. I don't want nobody that doesn't want me. I'll have time to try to convert nobody. Is not, I, I don't want nobody that doesn't want me. And that's pretty much the attitude that all of us have. We are not trying to convert people. However, what can't be said is that Black heterosexual folks are trying to convert us to go back in, or to make us be heterosexual like them. Now that is true. <laughs> so if you want to keep it real, but um, we hear and see a lot of these um, harmful stereotypes. You know where we see them the most these days in our films and television shows. Um, and, uh, you know, and sometimes in our conversations that we have with people, um, you know, we hear them, we don't correct people, we should correct people. Um, oh, my favorite one. Okay. Oh, I was supposed to take that off, but I didn't. Sorry. Um, can't say that no more. That's for real. These are words you can't say no more. Don't say them. Don't use them. Erase them from your vocabulary under no circumstances, unless you're, you know, doing some sort of journalism reporting um, and it is, you know, required to use the word in your reporting. But for folks who are uh, Caribbean or Jamaican, they will understand what Batty Boy means and Catcher and Chichiman. But the other words I added to the list, I, I don't like saying them, so you can just read them. But these are words that we don't use anymore. Um, in the Black community, I hear a lot of these words still being used. I hear a lot of them in rap songs still. I do. Um, and we we can't say this anymore. It, it's inappropriate. It's, it's not okay uh, under any circumstances. I don't care what generation you are. I don't care if you're a baby boomer. I don't care if you're Gen X. I don't care if you're from the silent generation. If you're older, the, we we're at this point in time we do not use these words and today you know we have what we have called cancel culture right where if you do get caught using these words they don't as a matter of fact they don't care if it was 30 years 30 years ago they'll pull it up and cancel you but the point is you can you can literally like you know 
find yourself, you know, in a world of, you know, trouble just um, from using these words. And I put these words here because I don't know if some people don't understand that they, sh I mean, I think people understand maybe the F word, right? But I don't know if everyone understands the other words, like he, she, you should never refer to anyone as that. I hear that a lot in the Black community. Um, homo, no. We don't even use the word homosexual anymore. Um, and so I think it's important that, you know, we are mindful. And there's a, probably a lot more words I could add to this to this um, list, but those are some of the the the, the more popular words. Yeah. Um, Before yeah. you move on, can I ask a quick question? Sure. I'm kind of glad you brought up those words, the offensive words, because I, I'm curious if you, in, in the LGBTQ plus community, sometimes you hear men, gay men refer to each other I guess in some ways that women might call each other like the B word, you hear them mm -hmm. call each other the F word or mm -hmm. it was another word on there that you actually hear them use towards each other, either in a casual. So how do we go about that where it, it's like, I, I for sure, I'm not going to call anyone the F word, but when it looks, is it, is it similar as like the N word and as the B word? Is that, it, that you hit it right there on the nail. So let's be clear. You know, just like how we are with the N word, how we, that we can use the like, disclaimer. I don't use the word, don't like the word, but there are people in our, there are black people who feel that they have claimed ownership of the word and is now a term of endearment. Um, it's that's the same thing with what you're talking about, right? So I have friends who will call each other queens, right? Um, you know, call each other other names, but that's an understanding between them. They have that relationship. They've given each other permission to do that. You know, it's sort of like, you know, as black women, you know, you could be with your girlfriend and be like, bitch, bitch, bitch. But, you know, let somebody else call you that. And it's like, taking the earrings yeah. off and it's time to fight. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of the same thing. You just want to stay away from it, period. Um, just because uh, they're doing it, does you're not them. You're not part, you know, so it's, it's, it's not something that you can engage in. Like, you know, yeah. Okay, Look it. at it as the N word. Jasmine, okay. Uh, Jasmine, on that point, because you're telling us today and I, and someone on this call, I called, when I was watching a show and someone identified themselves as queer. And I called someone on here and, and we had a lengthy discussion about it because what happens when there are certain words that evolve like queer has evolved? Do right. you cancel so us out because we said queer, because I don't say queer, but now I'm saying it because I've been given permission to say it. Right. I don't really use queer either. I actually don't care for the word personally. And that's why it's a generational thing. I think like Gen X and up, like we don't really care for that word. I think a lot of millennials and Gen Zers are okay with that term. As always, I think you should ask, right? I think you, it, or, you know, just, um, you know, yeah, I would ask. I mean, for me, for this conversation, I've been trying to bounce all over the place. Sometimes I say queer. Sometimes I say SGL. Sometimes I just say gay. Sometimes I say LGBTQ+. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that if, you, if it's a conversation, you should, um, you know, kind of just ask the person how they, you know, how they feel about that word. In journalism, now you do see uh, um, queer use a lot, takes up less space, doesn't it? Then, you know, putting, <laughs> you know, all, <laughs> all of the words, but, um, you know, it's just, you know, I think, again, you just kind of gotta, you gotta ask, you gotta, you gotta see, you know, I don't get offended when people use queer with me. I'm not one of those people that get offended. I just don't care for the word, but it's nothing I'm gonna like, you know, fall out over it's you know it's just you know some people like it some people don't yeah and um, the point was that because like there are some words on there that were acceptable there's some i'll tell you honestly i've never heard of before 
used in it, but is um, mm -hmm. is it going to be um, is queer going to be added to that list at some point? Queer was always on that list until recently. Quite frankly, so queer God was not God. a okay, huh? Exactly. Yeah, queer was always on that list. Like, people did not like the word. No, white people like the word queer a lot because they coined it, okay? But <laughs> black folks didn't really care for that word. Um, but, you know, now in 2020, I'm seeing, like, a lot of younger people that are, like, just kind of, like, okay with it. Um, again, I think it just depends. Like, for example, my writing style, when I talk about these issues, I don't really use the word queer. I will use LGBTQ, I will use same gender loving, but other people I, I know will, will use the word queer. So um, to answer your question, it was on the list, it's off the list now, people use it all the time. Um, and I think um, if it's a matter of like, when you're talking to someone, you should just kind of figure out, you know, how they feel about it. But most people honestly are not gonna, most people are not going to like have a heart attack if you use the word queer. I mean, we're, we're aware that it's an umbrella term that's being used to put everyone under the umbrella. Dorothy? Yeah. Is, are there other uh, terms? Uh, you mentioned, you know, queer is kind of an umbrella term. Um, yeah. You know, if, when you describe, when you want to describe the community, are there other acceptable terms? Are there other acceptable words that we should be choosing? I mean, you've given us a list of what not to say. Are there words uh, in term terminology that is, you know, is acceptable to most at least? Yes. No. I, I, in the document that I uploaded in the chat, I put in the LGBTQ um, terminology the a lot of the words that are um, acceptable, right? And so. You know, off the top of my head, we use queer, we use same gender loving, SGL. Some people still just say gay. There's of course LGBT, LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus. Um, you know, if you're just talking about, for example, the trans community, you might you might just specifically refer to them. For example, same thing like if you were just talking about you know lesbians, you wouldn't necessarily you know use one of the umbrella terms. But um, you know, for right now, you know, mainly what's out there is queer, SGL, same gender loving, LGBT, LGBTQ, and then LGBTQIA, LGBTQ plus. There's a couple of you know, endings after that cue that are out there. But as long as you put the plus there, you're safe, I think, because, you know, folks realize that there are a lot of other um, letters that come that have been added after Q. But there are, but there, I, I did add some words there that, um, that are, that people are okay with. Okay. Um, I have a quick um, question. Inclusion. Oh. Can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, go ahead. Why, why is a hetero or heterosexual acceptable when the counterparts, homosexual or homo, are not? It would seem that if you're going to use one, it implies it's the opposite of another one, and one, one is still being used, and the other one has fallen out of favor. Okay, so the, one of the reasons why is because the word was used in such a way to put um, queer people down for so long that I, I have it here too. I'm trying to pull it up because I had, I think I even put it on um, the terminology list that I um, made for you guys, but it was used for such a long time as like a derogatory uh, way to refer to um, gay people. Now the, the, the um, medical field, right? Like doctors and stuff, they would use that word, but outside of them, you know, when you think about, you know, these pastors and these other people and how they would use that word, it really um, developed a negative connotation for a lot of people. And so that word has kind of been put to rest for quite some time. Um, so Jasmine, is it basically, Jasmine, is, Jasmine, is essentially for Negro for us, so basically Negro was a common term used. If you yeah. call somebody Black Negro right now, you got a problem. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like the same thing or colored, right? Um, it's kind of, it's, I, I'd probably go with colored because some people might not be mind being called a Negro. But um, but yeah, it's, it's the same thing. It was, 
it was a word that was used. It now is viewed as being negative and, and um, as being derogatory and offensive, very offensive to, to nearly just about everybody. Um, and so we don't use that word anymore, particularly because it's also not an inclusive word, right? It's not a word that embraces all of the other identities and, um, you know, uh, expressions that we have that, that, that have come into play since that word um, was, um, this is that word originated, you know, like we were just talking about, there's LGBTQIA and different A's, different Q's, more than one I. So, you know, homosexuality is just not a word that's even inclusive at this point. It's, it's really irrelevant, quite frankly, but in a, addition to being offensive and derogatory. So my, my question is, then why would hetero still be acceptable? Because to me, hetero is used in conjunction, right? It, 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 and so... Can I well, answer? That's up to y'all. So homosexual I mean, well, is unacceptable. I, I, then why would heterosexual be acceptable? Because to me, heterosexual okay. is, is attached to homosexual. Okay, so, so it would be up to heterosexual people, I guess, to wage that battle, to get that... I mean, I hear some people use the word straight, and I know some people don't like that word straight. Um, and uh, they use the word straight to describe heterosexual people. Um, but remember, being heterosexual was never negative. It was never derogatory. It was never used to put someone down the way that the word homosexual was. You know, a lot of the words that we retire in our vocabulary are usually because they become outdated. They, we find them to be offensive now. Um, and derogatory, and that simply has never been the case with the word heterosexual. Travel, I think you had something to say. Yeah, I was just going to say, I feel like heterosexual is also used, uh, well, Chelsea put it in the chat, um, she says, because it fits into heteronormativity, which comes with a certain privilege. I was going to say that yeah. heterosexual, when it is most often used, um, is connecting you know, straight people, it's connecting straight people to their privilege that they have in our society. Mm -hmm. It is not, it, to your point, uh, Jasmine, it's not a derogatory term. Um, but again, you know, outside of that, I think only in like medical reporters, if you're a medical reporter, you might still use homosexual um, and heterosexual in, in regular parlance. Um, more often than not in our reporting, you won't even see people use heterosexual because more often than not, they're only identifying somebody's identity if it's not part of the norm, right? And so they will use gay, they will use queer, whatever the case may be. And so I think that's, that, that connection to, to privilege and to the system, right, that is at play is why we're still using heterosexual with greater um, prevalence than like homosexual in particular. Uh, and I will also add, right quick, Mr. I will also add, you know where else you will find homosexual still being used? in the black church pastors still like to use that word and when they do it's almost always to put us put the lgbtq community down to ostracize us um to push us further and further away from the truth so you know that word just has just been um for quite some time just offensive and derogatory and just um always used to just really, you know, put queer folks down to just, you know, make us feel like we're, you know, lower than the lowest piece of, you know, dirt on the ground. Dorothy, you had something to say? I did. I did. Um, just for clarifications for the, for the sake of the audience, uh, you know, Travell and Chelsea, and, and, and I know, you know, we've had this conversation about heterosexuals uh, in, in that connection to, to privilege. Can you just expound upon that and, and just, you know, what, what, that, what that means? Privilege, okay, uh, let me go. The, the, yeah, the connection, so that. Okay, no, I was just gonna go back to uh, one of these slides, okay. So going back to heteronormativity, which we had talked about, which is the assumption that, you know, everyone is heterosexual and that heterosexuality is superior to everything else. So if you are not heterosexual, if you are not straight, if you are not a masculine man and a feminine woman, something is wrong with you and you're an other. You're an other, you're not normal, 
And that's where the privilege comes in, right? And so I talked about how in systems of oppression, and I use the Black community, that even amongst us as Black folk, we can oppress other people. Like we have oppressed Black queer folks. We, we have done that. Now, granted, you know, we fight back a lot more than we, we, ha we did in the past. And granted, it's not as bad as it was, but when you think about what we've experienced in the Black church, what we've experienced in our families, um, when you um, think about, you know, like, for example, for me, you know, like seeing like, you know, all these young Black men, you know, who are kicked out of their homes and, you know, wind up on the streets, you know, LGBTQ plus youth, homeless youth is, is off the chart, for example, here in Los Angeles. So, you know, it's there. There is a certain amount of privilege there. That privilege turns into oppression when members of our community, when we decide that we are better than other people simply because we are one thing, that we're heterosexual, that we're, you know, and our way is the right way, and every every way else is weird and other. And because of that, you know, we're going to put you down. We're going to minimize you. We're going to throw microaggressions at you. We're going to discriminate against you. Um, and that's what has happened for a really, really long time. And it still happens today. I don't think it happens as much, but it still happens today to a lot of people in a lot of organizations. And I just, uh, sorry for my cat yelling in the background. Um, I just want to um, talk about privilege really quickly, specifically in regards to this organization. Um, when we think about uh, the convention, which is probably everyone's favorite event of the year with NABJ, um, I know of people in our task force who they don't like going to that career fair because they don't, um, they don't feel welcome at a lot of booths. So when you talk about privilege, um, or in regards to straight people being privileged, even within the Black community, being straight and even me i'm cis i'm straight presenting we have i have a privilege in being able to walk up to a booth and not have to even think twice about someone um discriminating against me or thinking twice about giving me that opportunity because i'm lgbtq now granted once they look at my resume they will realize that when they see you know co-chair da 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 but that's one way and how like privilege directly um is within this organization itself sorry for the gap yeah, I would say so. I think weirdo as a term, historically, it's one of those words that was used to identify and demean queer and trans people. Um, if you, if, and you can look back in, I don't know if anybody's into archival research or like looking back at old newspaper clips and stuff like that, but you can see the ways in which weirdo was a term that was weaponized in particularly against queer and trans people. Um, and so it has that kind of tethered connection um, in the ways that we spoke about um, the N word and you know other words like that. Um, and one of the things I said in the chat was that I think at its core, even though we may see weirdo as a term used for people who are not part of the queer community um, or people that are part of the queer community, at the core of it is, is a sort of othering and it is a sort of, of demeaning. Um, and it actually is an imprecise descriptor to, to describe however you feel about a particular person. And so I just would encourage people to um, just be more precise, right, in the ways in which you're trying to discuss, the, describe people um, in their actions. And I would just say quickly as another example of, of privilege within NABJ, um, even outside of the career fair for me as a non-binary person of trans experience, my, my transness, my queerness, you see it. Um, in a way that you may not see it with with Fanny, right? And so I've had issues at convention and even just being kind of a local chapter leader with like, you know, the, the way people look at you and judge you and, and say that like you, 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 either you don't belong or that you don't, you aren't a proper or an accurate representative of the organization, not because of my work, not because of my resume, but because of who I am and how I show up in the world. Um, I think, and you know, as, as cis identified, hat presenting people, most of you don't experience that. You also won't experience, you know, the, the women on the call, right? Y'all have experienced street harassment in a very particular way, right? Trans people experience 
street harassment um, in a different way than what you experience. And both of those types of street harassment, men, for example, may not experience in the same way, right? And so I think that's, I hope that that's just a, a way in which we talk about privilege and, and um, all of that, both in the organization as well as outside. The part of NABJ and the convention is all about networking and getting that access. And most of us can attest that that networking can literally make or break your career. That networking can be the difference in whether or not you do go into journalism or if you end up going into something else because you couldn't find a journalism job. And so when the environment doesn't feel inclusive and safe, people aren't getting that same networking opportunity. So for example, someone who, let's say uh, a trans college senior, if, if the space isn't welcoming and if they're going to one booth and they're just, they're getting this, the same thing Travel just spoke about, those, the eyes that you can just feel when you're not welcome. That means that person isn't getting the same thing that everyone else is getting at NABJ, which is unfortunate. We should all be able to get those, that same family feeling. We should all feel like we're, we went to one, you know, big three-day cookout. Um, it shouldn't just be some people getting not just that good feeling, but also those networking opportunities that literally makes a big difference in where your career goes. Thank you, Femi. Thank you, Travel. Uh, Jasmine, sorry to hijack it, but continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, just um, before I get into inclusion, just on that vein, Femi, and, and family that in this conversation, maybe, you know, when you're thinking about the convention for the upcoming convention, however that may be, <laughs> you know, I don't know how long COVID's going to be with us, but, you know, you think about, you know, making LGBTQ plus a bigger representation maybe in the convention, like cent centering it more um, in terms of the conversations and highlighting folks or something so that people do feel more welcome and comfortable. That might be an idea. So, um, quickly, inclusion, which, you know, is super important and, you know, who's responsible for that? That's a no-brainer, all of us. Um, and it's, you know, ultimately up to everyone in an organization um, to make the people around them feel safe. And, um, you know, when, you know, when people are valued, when people feel like they're being respected, um, you know, they, they, they bring, they can bring all of themselves to the table and they do much better work. Um, and there's, um, there's, there's a strong correlation between, um, you know, queer, queer folks, um, who feel that they are respected for who they are in their organizations, um, because they feel like their communications among their peers are more honest and transparent, um, they're appropriately involved in decisions that affect um, their work, whether it's a board or it's you know a newsroom or some other workspace. Um, they also feel like they can count on their colleagues um, when they need help, uh, and they also just feel like you know folks care about their opinions. And let's see how to be an ally, which is super important. I think is a huge part of this um, conversation. So, you know, what is an ally, right? Um, an ally is someone who speaks up on behalf of someone else. Um, an ally comes to the aid of others even when they are not the victim of the discrimination. An ally communicates um, clearly um, and in a concise manner and in a way that is empathetic, um, not judgmental or demeaning. Um, so no microaggressions. And an ally seeks to educate others um, to avoid future problems. So for, I wanna give you an example. Like I try to be an ally to the trans community um, because you know, as someone who looks like me, I don't have a lot of the problems that my trans sisters have as Travel was just um, alluding to, was just talking about. And so I try to be one of the people within the queer community that stands with, um, you know, my trans sisters and brothers, particularly uh, on this issue. I, I think all of you are aware of the numerous, you know, murders of Black trans women that have occurred in this country. And 
So that's sort of how, you know, an example of how I'm trying to stand up, right, as a Black woman, as a Black lesbian, um, for other members of my community, um, because it's important for me um, to be an ally. Um, just because, you know, uh, we're both Black, we're both un under the umbrella, doesn't mean that you can't be an ally to someone else. And so when we have conversations like this, where you have so many people with different opinions and different views um, on, um, you know, uh, you know, these, you know, LGBTQ plus sensitivity issues and, and, and they're just sort of, you know, learning how to, you know, to understand and to, and to deal with all of this, it's just really important to remember that you have a responsibility to be an ally. I think it is incumbent on all of us to, you know, correct people when they're, you know, saying things that are wrong about someone, to stand up for people, to be there for them, to educate yourselves. I mean, this is a part of that, right? We're having this discussion because you clearly wanted to educate yourselves on what some of the issues were. Um, that's on the road to being an ally. I don't know. I had a yeah. question about the ally. Is the term ally self-identified or is it from a comment upon an LGBTQ plus person to say you're an ally? I've, I've had this discussion with white people about when they do they consider themselves an ally or do we consider them an ally? Um, I think it's a little bit of both. I think some white folks just do consider themselves an ally and we don't necessarily consider them an ally. But when it comes to the queer community, I think that, um, again, I think it's a little bit of both. Do you feel like you're being an ally and do we feel like you are an ally, right? Because if that relationship is there, it is very, very clear. Like there's no questioning whether or not someone has your, you know who has your back. You know who, you know, who is trying, who speaks up for you, who includes you, um, who, you know, is out there, you know, trying to educate themselves, who always, like I said earlier, has your back, comes, comes to your rescue or comes to the rescue of the queer community when someone else says some, some, something smart make some, you know, uh, microaggression or some, you know, comment that they shouldn't have made or uses a slur that they shouldn't have used. So it's really clear who, who allies are. And so for some people, it's still uncomfortable. We kind of just stand there. We don't say anything. But a lot of people, a lot more people are feeling comfortable to just speak up and just say, hey, yo, man, that's not right. We shouldn't say that. Um, we're seeing a lot of that. Um, you know, happening, particularly, um, I see a lot of that happening um, uh, with, you know, some of these rappers and some, you know, in this inner, they're getting called out on their stuff, which I love, and they're having to come back and, and, and um, correct themselves. And, and the people who are calling them out are allies. Some of them are, you know, from the queer community, but a lot of them are not. So I think, um, I don't think you need permission to be an ally. Uh, you, there's no, you know, requirement that, uh, other than the the being supportive, caring, you know, having empathy, wanting to educate yourself, and standing up for other people. I mean, it, you know, it doesn't take more than that. So it has to be like a demonstrative act that is a, an act of allyship, not just what you and, think. Uh, you broke up. A, you broke up a little bit. Say that again. So. It, you have to make a demonstrative act to show that you're an ally, like the, the actual act of defending LGBTQ plus, or it is just a set of beliefs that you have in terms of what you look at the community. Yeah, I think, I think it's maybe a combination of both. I mean, there, you don't, look, there, for some people, there may not ever be a time when they need to actually, you know, you know, come to the rescue of someone but for some other people, there will be an opportunity for them and they need to be willing to be able to do that, right? So that's why I said it's a combination of both. You have to know in your heart that you have the back of the queer community um, and that you know if you see something going down that's not right or you're a part of a conversation that isn't right, um, that you're gonna, you're gonna feel strong enough to speak up for folks. And I think that's really, really important. 
um, again, like I, you know, you don't need permission to do it. Um, and I, on this, on this call, a number of you guys have, um, have said through your comments, basically that you are allies through some of your statements, your I am, but I'm not statements and, and other comments that I heard. And so it's clear that there are people who are allies to the queer community, um, on, you know, participating in this meeting. Um, but you know, for folks who are not there yet, I mean, you know, these are some of the things that you can do. This is why it's important. Um, you know, you know, sometimes when I have these conversations and it's really hard, I just try to remind people, like, take LGBTQ out, take queer out, just put black there. And just think about, like, how you would feel if you, you know, were in some conversation and they were, you know, saying, you know, derogatory things about black people. You know, and, you know, you had um, a, a friend who, let's just say, wasn't Black, let's say was white, who was also part of that conversation and was your friend, and your friend didn't say anything at all. What kind of friend would that be, right? And so, you know, it's important that, you know, allies don't just call themselves allies, but when the opportunity arises, when we need them to be there, that they're willing to be there, for example, in Los Angeles, they had a uh, like an event downtown at City Hall, um, calling attention to the black, uh, the murders of black trans women, and I went. Like I got up, went downtown, and I participated. That for me was being an ally and showing up um, and being there because I thought that that was important. Um, I'll give you another example. Uh, for three years, I chased this Democratic donor named Ed Buck, uh, who had had two Black gay men die in his home of crystal meth overdoses, and finally got him in jail. And, um, you know, side note, people always thought I was this Black straight woman. They were like, oh, it's so nice. You're this Black straight woman, and you're supporting these Black gay men, and you're out here trying to get justice for them. And I'd be like, oh, no, but I'm a part of the community because I'm an ally, right? You can be an ally to, as a Black lesbian woman. I can be an ally to Black gay men. So, it, you know, it shows up in different ways. I mean, as long as it's authentic, you have to figure out, no one can tell you how to be an ally. I can give you the tools. I can kind of tell you what it looks like, but you know, everyone's, everyone's situation is going to be different. Everyone's opportunity to be an ally is going to be different. I think what's important is that the willingness is there for you to do it. For some people, they're just like, no, uh, -uh I'm not getting involved in that. I'm, mm -mm, I'm not, but other people actually do care. They they don't want to stand by and watch other people discriminated against. They do want to do something to make sure. I mean, look, we had that All Black Lives Matter march here in Los Angeles, uh, and it was a beautiful thing. But let me tell you something. That wasn't all Black queer folk. That was a lot of allies that were out there marching. A lot. Um, you know, so it shows up in different ways. Um yeah, I think somebody, did anybody have their hands up? I'm sorry. I had a question. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I can go after. I was just thinking of was she answering the question about allyship. That was important. Appreciate that. No problem. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> Jasmine, this is Chelsea. This has been um, so, so great. I did have a question um, in terms of some of the challenges people face when trying to be in, um, in in right relationship with folks and trying to be allies. One of the hardest things can be um, just dealing with the fact that you're, like you said earlier, you're gonna make mistakes, but also that there is a level of discomfort um, that comes with learning this new skill set and just learning hard truths about how you might have shown up in the past. Can you speak a little bit about what folks can do in those tense moments when you're actually maybe being call not called out, but hopefully called in for having um, not done something right or having misspoke, misgendered someone or just not having shown up in a way that was helpful. Um, I, I think it would be great for us to hear just a little bit about like how we should handle those moments and how we can work through those tense moments to move into better relationship with folks. I think, first of all, it's okay. It you have to be okay with being uncomfortable um, in, 
in this situation period, right? Because there are going to be mis- I make mistakes. I, I told you earlier about how guilty I felt about um, uh, not using the correct pronouns for Travel during a phone call. Um, and so, you know, be comfortable with making mistakes. And, you know, I said to you also earlier, and I'm going to repeat it again, it's, it's a two-way street. Like, you may not have been there and you may get called out for it, but you're there and, and you're, you know, doing your best trying to be an ally. And for, I'll just use me as an example, I have a responsibility to let you do that. Right. Um, you know, what, one of the things I hate is like when um, the white gay community just complains, 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 complains about what, you know, people do, but they don't ever give them credit for trying to, um, or correcting or course correcting or correcting their behavior. And we have to do that. We have to give people the space to make mistakes and learn and then come back and um, do things the right way. And so I think as long as you're okay with understanding that you may be, um, you know, people may say something to you about your past behavior, but you're willing to stand in your resolve and move forward. I mean, look, I'll use myself for an example. Back in the day, day, um, I wasn't too happy about um, illegal immigration. Like, I just wasn't. It wasn't my thing. I wasn't, mm -mm. But then I traveled around the world. I went to Africa. I went to Mexico. I went to all these other poor places. I saw people were living. And it completely changed how I looked at immigration um, in this country. And so, you know, every now and then somebody will make a smart comment on social media. But you said that. And it's like, honey, I'm allowed to evolve. You're allowed to evolve. Life is about evolving. We're constantly changing. This whole conversation has been about how we went from homosexual to queer to LGBTQIA plus, 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 plus. We're always evolving. And so, you know, hopefully that doesn't happen to you. But if it does, you should just, you know, don't let it discourage you from from moving forward and continuing to be an ally. Travel. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to also add, you know, um, I, I know I come off as knowing all this stuff, but, you know, for those of you who know, I host a podcast, um, and one of the things I've had to get comfortable with was, was also, like, you know, um, undoing and, and um, the, the ways in which I use ableist language, right, sometimes, and I think uh, a tool for people to remember when you're being corrected, perhaps, is that, you know, we can't get defensive when someone is, is correcting us, um, we, we should not make it a big deal, right? We should address the behavior, change, and then move forward. Um, because I think that sometimes, you know, we can feel attacked when somebody is just like correcting us on pronouns or somebody's telling us that a certain, you know, language we shouldn't be using. I think if we start from a place of, of like listening and, and growing as opposed to to a, a place of defensiveness that might also be useful um, for some folks. Yeah, no, I agree. And that's also why I kind of always say, you know, cause at the same time, like I do believe the queer community has a responsibility in all of this too. Like, you know, we can't, you know, eat people up every time they make a mistake. We have to give people, we have to allow people to make mistakes and, um, and to learn and to, and to, you know, grow from them. Okay, so uh, some things we can do, develop cultural competence, use inclusive language. We talked a lot about inclusive language today. Speak up, um, personalize it, you know, you know, personalize it, let people know, you know, of your connections with other queer people and, you know, how we relate to people as individuals directly impacts our ability to create a warm and welcoming environment for everyone, which is super important. Uh, Yes, creating a more inclusive environment. These are a couple of things I want to leave you with. Do not make assumptions. Don't make assumptions. Um, let me come out when I'm ready. You know, that's another thing in our community. You know, we like to out people, let people come out when they're ready. It's okay to ask about people's partners. Um, just be respectful in the way that you do it. Um, but don't be nosy. 
if I had a wife, you could ask about her, but don't ask about my sex life because that's not your business. You know, it's just all in how you do it. Um, tell me about your other gay friends. Um, don't only talk about my sexuality or gender. Educate yourself. Make an effort with my pronouns, which is really important. If people see that you're making an effort, they will definitely meet you halfway. Um, stick up for me. Show you care about the LGBTQ community. And don't be afraid to make mistakes. I mean, I think those are the biggest things we can all do. Um, the assumptions is huge. Making an effort with people's pronouns means the world to a lot of people because their identity is everything. And if you're acknowledging their pronouns, you're acknowledging that they exist and you're acknowledging who they are. And that's important. Um, you know, not being afraid to make mistakes. I've, I've said that over and over again because I just want people to be okay with making a mistake because no one's going to get it perfect. I don't get it perfect. I don't get it right all the time, but I'm always open to learning and hearing from people. I can tell you, I started to put this video in here, but I didn't. Like, I did this whole, I have a podcast, like this whole conversation with some of my um, Black trans sisters. And it was a real conversation. And I, at one point I said to them, you know, but why do we have to um, something? I said, like, why do we have to deal with all these um, pronouns? And you know, my friend really checked me. She was just like, for all these years, we've had to deal with this, this, and this. And you can do, you know, it. You this is the least you can do. And the way she broke it down for me was like, kind of like, yeah, okay, I see your point. Because for all these years, you were pretty much invisible, and we were not. You know, even even under the queer umbrella, there is privilege for people that look like me, right? Um, and so it's great to um, acknowledge that, learn how to be an ally, um, stick up for folks. Um, but, you know, some of these other things, you know, like I said, let people come out when they're ready. Don't be too nosy about people's lives. You know, that that's kind of, you know, common sense, Tori. So one of the points uh, in this list, sure, tell me about your other gay friends. That is surprising to me because I would think that would be offensive for, you know, if for a straight person or sorry, heterosexual person be like, let me tell you about some of my heterosexual friends. Like that's surprising to me. Like why would anyone, well, you tell me, why is that? No, it's just how you, it's just how you do it. I mean, it happens a lot. Um, and it's okay, uh, as long as the person you're talking to is okay with it, but it's just how you do it, you know, I, you know, I don't, I'm trying to think of a good example. Because I think of like the, the, the old one, some of my best friends are black, like. <laughs> no, I would, no, not one, that would not be one of the examples I would use, but I would use an example, like if, you know, you're having a conversation with one of your colleagues about something, and you do have um, a lesbian couple friend that has a child, and it has, it's a part of the conversation, so you bring it up, you include it in the conversation, that's appropriate, that's okay, okay. you understand what I'm saying, it, not only does it show that you know other queer people besides the person that you're talking to, but it just, I don't know, it's a part of a normal conversation. Um, yeah, I'm not saying it in the way of that. I, I can't stand that either. I have a lot of gay friends. No, not in that way, but just, you know, normalizing it in a conversation, um, making just, people feel comfortable. Um, at this point in our lives, we should all have family members and friends and people that we work with and in our lives who are queer that we have relationships with. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's okay to talk to us about them when it's appropriate. It's, you know, it's fine. Can I just now, say don't something? Assume, quick? Oh. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, um, I think like, 10, 15 years ago, uh, it was normal to just sort of pretend that you didn't have the gay aunt or pretend that you didn't have the gay friend. And that was considered being, back then that was considered being inclusive and okay because you're just pretending it doesn't exist. Whereas I think what Jasmine is trying to get at and correct me if I'm wrong, is that like, no, we do exist. So when you are talking to someone and everyone's talking about whether or not it's the 
child, my husband did this last night, da, 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 involving the other person, because even though they have a wife, they probably have some of those same complaints. So I think that's basically what Jasmine is getting at. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's great. Like, that's a great addition to it. Yes, absolutely. It's just all about, it's so weird, but it's like, queer people just want to be treated normally like you treat everybody else that you have conversations with like you know learn our pronouns um there might be a couple other things but I mean it's not difficult I mean these are those these are things that you should you shouldn't be making assumptions anyway whether someone's queer or not you know these are um just things that we should already be thinking about or be doing or you know so hopefully that's helpful I can't see everybody. Did anybody else? Let me see if I can see everybody. Did yeah, anybody I, else have a question about this? I do. Okay. Well, a comment, I guess. I think if you're coming from a place of love or just wanting to know, learn, educate, and there's empathy there, it's okay to ask, you know, some of these things. It's okay to refer to your friends or a couple, you know, but when you, and the person will know that, you know, that you're talking to where you're coming from but if you're coming from a place of just wanting to know or nosy you know that's not the right thing but if you're coming from a pa place of really wanting to learn understand become an ally be you know continuing to um be an ally already then it's okay and the person will know that and that's what you need to come with yeah no, i actually agree like the the example I gave earlier um, was like, you know, the colleague who asked his queer colleague about the queer television show because he just assumed because his colleague was queer that he knew all about that show and he had never taken the time to ask. Like, you know, that's an assumption, right? And we shouldn't, you know, be doing, you know, those things. We should ask people. And you're absolutely right. If you come from a place of love, everybody knows when somebody's talking to them with respect, with love, um, wanting to learn. It's very easy to tell when people are like how I'm talking to you, right? It's very easy to tell when when someone is open to receiving knowledge and is really trying. Okay. Okay, let's say what else we have. Okay. Closing discussion. Um, so did you learn anything new? Did you learn how to be a better ally? Do you think any of this will help you create a more welcoming environment at home, at work, um, in other spaces that you operate in? I, I think it's been extremely informative. Um, you know, what it, what it has done for me and, and just the last, uh, a uh, few months, you know, not just a day, it's just been an opportunity to just, you know, think about things that I hadn't thought of before um, and just ask, um, you know, to ask questions and to learn. And, and this, was, this was very, very educational. So I've, I've definitely learned a lot about, uh, you know, what's offensive, what's not, uh, different words, and more importantly, how to make sure that when you're, you know, when you're talking to people that, that, you're, that, that you are respectful and that you're open and, and not to be defensive because it's, you know, it's gonna take time on both sides. So it's, uh, so, so thank you, I've, I've learned a lot. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I hope that you um, are leading this conversation um, a little bit more empowered, a little bit more um, inspired to be a good ally and to be more inclusive. And, you know, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions um, in the future. And I just appreciate being able to be a part of this conversation.